started. So first, a hearty welcome, everybody. My name is Michael Largo. I'm the superintendent for the Langley Park and Recreation District. Really, really happy to see all of you here in person and special welcome to all of those that have chosen to join us virtually tonight. Um, we're thrilled to kick off a project, um, and this is an update of our 2012 comp comprehensive plan. Um, so really, we're excited because you get to help shape what you want your park district to be like for the next five, 10 years. Um, we're we're uh, really thrilled to have Barry Dunn with us. It's consultants that we've hired, and they are painstakingly going to get so much input from the board of directors, from staff. But the most important thing and the most important people in this process is all of you. We really want to hear what our community wants out of your park and recreation district. So I'm um, really happy that you're able to share that. You're uh, happy that you're engaged. You're going to hear a little bit more later about how you can become even more engaged in the process. But tonight is really going to be a great part of that process. So um, tonight, the meeting's going to be uh, moderated by our own Jody Del Serre, who is one of our amazing uh, staff members with our Willamette Lanes Community Engagement Team. And um, I don't see any elected officials either in the crowd or online. So we'll thank them later. But uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jody Del Serre. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Jody. Thank you, Michael. I'm Jody. I'm a member of the community engagement team here at the Lime Lane. I've been moderator tonight. And I really want to thank you for being part of this process. This meeting is happening tonight both here at the Lime Lane at the Tech Service Center and the Lionel Lane Academy. After our presentation, our project team will have questions. For those who are here in person, you have a question sheet on your chair. It might be on your left now. Go ahead and write any questions on your question sheet, hold up in the air, and the Willamette Lane staff members will pick it up for you. If you're on Microsoft Teams, go ahead and write your question in the chat, and questions will be answered in the order that they come. And note that this meeting is public, so it's a public meeting on public record, and therefore it's being recorded right now. To be conscious of everyone's time, we'll be stopping at 7.30 p.m., and we'll give you the contact information of our project team if you have any other follow-up questions or things that are in plan. I'd like to introduce you to some of the people here tonight. Our speakers this evening are Jeff Elkis and James Mitchell from our consulting agency, Barry Young. We also have members of the Lab Lanes management team here. You just met Michael Wardo, our superintendent. We also have Eric Adams, our parks and planning and facilities director, and Kenny Wyman, our community management director. Um, and our signing person here on screen tonight is Linda Hall. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Jeff and James. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, it's great to have uh, some folks here in person and a uh, special welcome to everybody out in the virtual meeting. We will be asking those of you in the virtual meeting a few questions to put in the chat room in a little bit later. But in the meantime, our purpose tonight is to present to you the findings of what we have done this week. We've spoken to quite a few focus group participants, stakeholders, staff. Uh, we came on board with the intention of learning as much as we can. Uh, by way of introduction, again, as uh, Jody said, my name is Jeff Milkus. I consult with Barry Dunn, and I've been a practitioner for, oh, 37 years in the field. And in addition to, to that, I um, professionally do comprehensive plans for parks and recreation agencies. And um, I'd like to ask James, who's with Barry Dunn as well, to introduce himself. Absolutely. Again, my name is James Mickle. I'm a consultant with Barry Dunn. I consulted on this project. I'm a strong second to Jeff. Um, I come with 25 years of parts of recreation experience and I'm from just a couple of miles away in Virginia Beach, Virginia. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here. The district is beautiful. Your amenities are, are gorgeous and look forward to working. Thank you, James. Okay. Uh, you can see that the team includes uh, not only James and I, but there's a number of other people here, uh, at least by reference to introduce you to. Uh, David Peterson and Kaylin Delaire were two individuals who all week have been out in your parks, and they've been analyzing and evaluating everything that is in your parks and everything that may not be in your parks. They, uh, they're, they're experts at 
uh, level of service analysis and taking inventory. Um, we have two other uh, sub consultants that uh, may be of interest. We will be doing some survey work and we'll be talking to you about that in a bit. RRC is our, our survey firm uh, and Sierra Design is a landscape architect firm that will be helping us there out of Portland and will be specializing in uh, really taking a deep dive into your trail system, mapping trails, looking at uh, capital cost as well of potential improvements. Next. Uh, it's important as we start to talk about some of the results of what we learned this week to have everybody understand that no decisions have been made at this point. It will take us about a year and a half to complete the project and the community engagement process that has started this week won't actually end until the point at which the board of directors approves and adopts the uh, comprehensive plan. So even up to the last moment, we'll be asking people to confirm and, and provide input. Uh, so it's important to understand again, what will be what we will be providing you tonight is literally what we learned and what we heard. The public engagement process, uh, this is only one part of that process. It includes, as I said, the survey, it includes uh, review of, of other, other data and confirmation of things that we find. It includes potential uh, intercept opportunities. It includes meetings that we'll have with young people and teens. We will continue to figure out what the pulse of the community is so that we can truly understand needs, desires, priorities, and visions. And we won't stop until we understand and we get there. So again, as Michael said, this is a 20 year update, 20 year plan to the 2012 comprehensive plan. It's going to be fully implementable. It's a promise that we made to the district when we started the project, meaning that we, we will recommend and, and create the building blocks for this plan um, made up of only things that we know are possible. Uh, it will be compliant with statewide planning goals. Um, we will look through uh, a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens at just about every stop or every, every place in the process to ensure that all community members in the district have an opportunity to come to the table. And if there are those that can't come to the table, our intention is to take the table to them. The plan will be in concert with other planning documents to ensure that uh, say the, the plans and, and such with the city of Springfield and other areas are all together meshed into a, a comprehensive plan for the district that isn't, uh, isn't in contradiction. And of course, the plan will be based almost solely on robust community engagement. Staff have some input and we'll talk a little bit about how that works, but the primary focus, almost all of it is what does the community need, desire, and, and really what direction do they want their program to go? So this is what we call our information gathering, and this is who we spoke with this week uh, that we'll, we will be, be reporting tonight. Stakeholder interviews. Uh, we, have, we started with a couple of interviews and we've got six more scheduled. A stakeholder is different than others in that these are the key leaders in the community, people that tend to see life from about 3,000 the 3,000 foot level and can help us to understand uh, priorities and vision for where the district may may or may not want to go. Some of those are listed here. You can see we we will be talking with spring with the Springfield mayor. We've had some wonderful conversations, uh, say with the school district superintendent, with the general manager of the Springfield Utility Board. We will be moving forward with a number of other of these that will include the uh, the district board of directors. And focus groups were the main emphasis this week. And we spoke to 40 individuals who were basically either recreation users, community members, advocates, uh, sports advocates, aquatic advocates, um, people that, that took classes in different facilities that could have been uh, folks that, that used the wonderful wood shop or the rock shop here in the activity center, folks that, that swam, swam with, you know, swam apps. Say in, in, in 
We also spoke to a number of staff and our purpose of doing that was to help to build the survey that will be coming coming out and again that we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, we created a, a SWOT analysis on a survey, and we also entertained staff to come and talk with us because this gave us their perspective on some of the kind of issues that we really need to pay attention to. So we started with one, with, you know, one simple question uh, for the focus group participants. We wanted to know how long people have been a resident here in Springfield or, or a member of the a resident within the district community member. And you can see that we had a fairly uh, a fairly reasonable spread of individuals. Uh, what we what we don't want is a majority of people to be brand new to the district, or even for that matter. You all have been here greater than 21 years so that we can get a good in a good amount of input and get a good set of perspective. So you can see in terms of years of years of residency that um, we did have a pretty good mix. They're pretty similar. Next. So we started the process by asking people, what does the district do well? What are the strengths of the district? And here's what they told us that the customer service in the district, I, I won't, won't be talking about each of these, but I'll, I'll hit some of the key ones. The customer service in the, in the district was very much appreciated by members of the community. Um, responsiveness, um, resiliency toward um, uh, figuring out ways to solve problems for uh, community members. Um, the diversity of activities and programs was really significant. Now you see that this is a, a bar chart behind me um, you can uh, you can understand here, hopefully, that that these represent items that were repeated over and over again. Areas or items that were not repeated are either uh, represented fairly minimally or or not represented on these slides. So diversity of activities and programs, uh, people really enjoyed the fact that there was something for everyone. Uh, parks maintenance was uh, uh, provided many, many positive comments that folks are able to fix and repair and, and ensure that parks would you know, look pretty good or look very good. The trail system was something that was well used in the minds of our focus group individuals and very much appreciated. Um, some other things, youth programs, uh, positive, uh, you know, positive growth. The one pass was very, very, um, uh, you know, people would really, really appreciate it. And you can see the other list there. They're, uh, they're all important. Again, we aren't drawing conclusions that these are the most important strengths at this point, but we'll add these to the, the greater list. Okay, so then we moved, moved to the next question. And even given everything that we, that we learned about the great things the district is able to do and accomplish, we ask about areas of improvement. What can the district do better? And this is what we learned. So they would like to see more opportunities to get involved. Call us. You know, we would like to sign up to be volunteers, a much stronger volunteer program. Uh, folks told us they wanted to connect on their with their bikes and their trails. And this isn't unusual. Uh, in a lot of comprehensive plans or master plans for parks agencies, a connected trail system sometimes or most of the time kind of rises to the top and follows national and, and state uh, trends. So again, con uh, connectivity of the bike areas. Dog stations in parks was important. And indeed, having additional dog parks uh, was important to community members. Uh, folks, told us about challenges they had with, in terms of ADA uh, access into the parks or into facilities at times that really may have had a challenge and really wanted uh, assistance. We did get almost across the board uh, a strong message that staff really try hard to accommodate people, but there are some things that physically just need to be addressed. Uh, there's a lot of smaller amenities we heard about park benches. We heard about trash cans in parks. We also heard about river access. 
in the fact that the additional access and indeed ease of use of the rivers uh, was something that we heard quite a bit. An example of that might be for people who want to kayak, you know, kayak launches, or folks that would like to paddleboard when the river current isn't quite as strong. Uh, uh, stations or areas where uh, the, uh, the paddle boards can be inflated or tubes could be inflated on the site. Um, there was quite a bit of discussion about the, the activity guide and the activity guide will be a point of discussion after the survey to see what kind of communication you would like and other community members would like to see and how people, not only how they receive their information, but how they want to receive their information. But the activity guide was a discussion item and, and to a certain extent uh, related to individuals of a little more advanced age. So we heard about classes. Uh, and activity times, meaning that there's a desire to have the same classes or many of the classes that are offered, but offered at, at extended time so that people can get access. And this is the this is the challenge that the district uh, that we heard the district has is that that sometimes they might be their own their own greatest enemy because they've created such a strong, high quality set of classes and enrichment activities that there's so much demand, but yet, as you know, across the nation, across Oregon and here in Eugene Springfield environment, it's hard to get, get employees. It's hard to find people to help teach those classes. So, uh, you know, same thing with recruiting lifeguards and such, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, restrooms and parks, uh, sometimes they're unavailable. And again, there are outside issues that occur here. We heard about the vandalism, we heard about uh, nefarious activities within the, the, the parks. It's absolutely uh, occurs between, you know, all up and down the Willamette Valley here. It's unfortunate, but the, the staff seem to really, um, really give it their best effort. But unfortunately, some of that leads to the closure of restaurants at times. Um, let's see. Um, we also heard about um, issues with fitness centers and a need to upgrade equipment in the fitness centers, especially having to do with the past sales and the people buy passes and, you know, they would expect a, a different kind of equipment. So we're going to look into that as we move forward, depending on what the rest of the engagement process tells us. So then we asked folks, we said, okay, now we know a little bit about the strengths and no areas they can improve. What are the activities that you'd like to see that perhaps the district either isn't offering or, or you know, can? And it, it's really a, it's really a, it's a challenge because um, we know that in the case of like uh, camps and such, there are tremendous waiting lists. The the demand is outpaced as we heard the uh, the ability to provide some of the service. So let's look at the activities that people told us they would like the district to, to consider. Um, additional special events in parks, outdoor movies, concerts, and particular emphasis with cultural events. So individuals that may be um, of Hispanic background um, seem very interested in having events that, that would appeal to, to those, those folks. Um, enrichment classes, more of them, uh, again, family activities, environmental education and outdoor programs. You heard about that, particularly additional rental opportunities for equipment. Uh, we heard about pickleball classes. We heard about disc golf events and classes. Um, and particularly, probably, although it's lowest on this list, it may be, uh, it may surface to the top, and I suspect as we go forward, are activities for kind of a gap area. In other words, the district is able to offer activities and really focuses on young children and folks who are over 50. But there's this, this link in the middle, this gap in terms of family activities. Again, we have not at this point reviewed all the data and the registration information and all. Again, I'm just reporting what we what we heard from community members, primarily in those focus groups. So then we asked you about recreational amenities. What are those amenities? What are those things in the parks that would be really helpful to increase your ability to have a, a great user experience? And indeed, what kind of new parks or new, or new uh, 
opportunities for access to parks can in the district provide. What we heard was thoughts about disc golf. Disc golf is a great sport. Um, but again, we know we have a limited sample. And so now we will be surveying to ensure that that the priority in the community or a primary is truly uh, truly disc golf. Pickleball courts. And in terms of this one, I have little doubt that the survey data will probably probably have that rise up here at the top as well. Those are those are two of the most um, quickly growing participatory sports uh, that we have in the country. Um, family friendly restrooms in parks, dog parks. You've got one dog park in the east part of the uh, or the one part of the city, and really to get to it. Uh, we think that the community, what we've heard, will probably desire a second dog park. Uh, dog stations in parks. We heard a lot about splash pads. Folks that, that would like to have, and, and splash pad is a built environment where you push a button and you can get water to kind of rain down over the top of you. It's a great cooling opportunity. Uh, there are some specific requirements in the state as far as having um, circulated water and, and such, and, and you have to approach it really carefully to ensure that you're doing things you know, correctly and uh, responsibly. Uh, pump track is important to people, an all-inclusive playground, something that is a showcase for the district that would be, um, that, that would be fun in order to accommodate everyone in every ability level. A, an inclusive playground differs from a regular playground in that a regular playground may meet the, the stringent ADA standards, but not everything in that playground necessarily has to provide access to everyone. As long as there are certain transfer opportunities into the playground equipment, as long as this, the, the material, that the fall protection material is of a certain certain kind so that, that wheelchairs can, can get over the top of it and keep and get access to use the playground. That's kind of the standard, but an all-inclusive playground has a much higher standard, and that would attract uh, individuals that have uh, uh, ind individual disabilities that, that aren't just ambulatory. There's a whole host of different opportunities within these inclusive playgrounds. Um, bike paths to uh, promote connectivity and safety. We heard a little bit about um, different kinds of amenities uh, that that would really be good for um, for individuals as well as as the the larger group community gardens artwork uh, we heard about in the parks we heard about bilingual signage next okay so then we asked about barriers we said if you if you don't go to your park as much as you want what are those barriers that may limit access to you? What are those things that would keep you from having the opportunity to go into your park and to, to do things? And what we learned was um, that the availability of facilities. Now we know we need to, to couch this with the fact that we're we're still very much in a pandemic and we're coming out of the pandemic and, and life really changed when that hit. Across the country, parks agencies. Um, almost right away had to pivot to ensure that, that people's needs were met. Use of parks across the United States skyrocketed. When you look to see originally in the first year and a half of the, of the pandemic, what facilities, uh, what kinds of things people did, they stopped going to, you know, frequently uh, lowered their number of times they went to the grocery store or the shopping mall or movie theaters or stopped going altogether. But parks, in many cases, double their double participation. Trails got so busy up in the, up in the Portland area that the um, along the Cascade area and uh, the, uh, the gorge, many trails had to close not because it was dangerous, but because there were too many people on. And so, uh, anyway, what we heard was uh, facility availability, and right now the district continues to suffer from. The ability to recruit lifeguards and such, and again, nationwide, that's that's a real challenge. Which is why the the splash at, at Langley Park is, is not operating. 
Um, accessibility, ADA accessibility. Um, people, it's a limit for individuals, and we'll ask those questions in the survey. We'll ask people, do you have a disability? What kind of disability is it? Where do you live? And also, is this a challenge for you to use your parks? And from that, we can start molding what might be a, a need. Um, district outreach to non-users. In other words, people that, that know about the district and are advocates and are, are heavy users had concerns that maybe there's others in the district that may not be people who are using the parks or using the community center programs or the swimming pools. And as a result, additional outreach to look for new users is so important. Um, we looked at um, parking at Clearwater Park. We heard we heard about pedestrian walking routes to parks. And we also heard from members of the Latinx community, uh, Hispanic community, that um, sometimes they didn't always feel welcome in the parks. But we're going to make sure, we're going to find out. Uh, and, and we have our ways through the survey of, of really best understanding that. So then we asked about key partners and stakeholders. And this is important because we want to know who is it that the district can work with. And um, this is what we learned. Um, we know already um, that schools are really, really, uh, you know, the Springfield School District is is really a, a super partner, as is the Springfield Utility Board. Um, but this is what we learned. Um, the university, um, volunteers are key partners, um, Lane Community College, Sorry. AARP, and again, I, I don't need to read these, but the Team Eugene Aquatics was, um, was an important one in, our, in terms of our, uh, our focus group research. Uh, this is the group that tends to really use the facilities. There are some businesses in there, radio stations. Uh, the school district is there. Uh, but again, I think that folks really just thought, well, the school district is a no-brainer. We all know that's probably most important. So we go down through the list there. You can see the historical society. Uh, this, the library. The library can be a really, really good partner. And that's the key partners and stakeholders. So then we ask, um, we ask a question of all of the, the participants, the focus group participants. How satisfied they were with the existing programs, activities, and facilities? Now, satisfaction to me is not a really important priority part of the master plan. We want the master plan to be aspirational. We want it to look forward for the next 20 years. But to give us perspective, we wanted to kind of know where does the community feel? And again, this is an extremely uh, small uh, sample of the community. Uh, but this gives us a general idea on, on, on what kinds of questions you need to ask in the survey. So you can see we ask on a scale of one to five. Can you tell us how satisfied you are with programs, classes, events, parks, and, and some of the facilities. Um, knowing that um, it's awfully difficult to rate all of the parks in one score, when some of the parks are maybe very good for you and some of the parks, you know, may be, may be different. But this, again, gives us perspective. So this is what we found. Um, you can see that the, the, the green is excellent. Um, the blue is very good. So those areas you can see in terms of splash at Library Park, um, almost entirely good or excellent. The, the swim center, this facility, uh, the Bob Peter facility, they're all really, really good or excellent. Same with the parks. Um, special events offered by the district um, ended up to be kind of a little more average, a little more good rather than, than excellent. And um, you know, the district programs and classes were rated a little lower than the others, but nothing to be concerned about. And I think that it's probably uh, probably related to um, the fact that it's difficult during the you know it's been difficult the last two years to actually offer some of the classes and and have have good participation. Same thing with the events. I think at the end, if we were to do this again. I think, you know, in a year's time, we'll probably get a little, uh, a little different results. 
But these these are results to celebrate. They're really, really good. So the next steps in this process um, is to do the survey. And there will be two parts to the survey. And we'd, we'd like you to consider assisting us with, with this survey. The survey, uh, the part one is what we call our, our, our invite random survey. The random survey will be mailed out first a postcard and then a paper survey for roughly 3,000 people in the community, in the district. Now, we don't expect to get a response rate of all 3,000. Uh, we would, would celebrate if we did, um, but we will get enough, I am reasonably, uh, reasonably sure, to make that part statistically valid, meaning that decision makers can use that data uh, and be pretty sure within three or five percent margin of error that, um, that what they are seeing from the community is correct. Well, you'll finish that. That will take place in the first yeah. part of June at some point. We'll move on to an open link survey near the end of June as we move closer toward, toward July. The open link will be the same survey, but it will provide everyone I I had one, but the opportunity to complete that survey. And we'll encourage everyone to do it. We will be marketing it. We will be putting it in everybody's hand at Isaiah facilities hoping that we can get them and everybody the opportunity. The, uh, in the case of the invite survey, those folks will have an online code that is unique to themselves to protect the integrity of the survey process. The open link will be the same code open for everyone. We do have the ability to track um, the different computers that the survey is completed on to know that we're, we're not getting inundated with a particular group who wants to advocate for their their need or their desire. So we can ensure that it's absolutely, absolutely straight up for us. From there, we start to move in and we'll be preparing a demographic analysis of the community, looking forward five and 10 and 10 years and beyond to figure out where we think the growth is going to be, where residential growth is going to be and what, what response the district will need to have to that growth. We'll be looking at uh, trends, opportunities, national, nationally, from a state standpoint, looking at the statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation uh, report, which we call the SCORP report. We'll be looking at, at various different, different scholarly research opportunities and such. We will be able to present to the district what we think the, the relevant trends are going to be uh, over the next five or 10 years. Now, granted, we have to get out on a crystal ball to try to, to figure but I, I can tell you that many years ago, we were presenting folks um, the idea of pickleball before pickleball was really popular here in the Northwest. It turned out to be correct with that. So we'll be providing that to the district to, to consider. We'll be looking at what we call a level of service analysis next. And just a brief, brief couple of comments about the level of service analysis. This tries to answer the question, do you have enough parks? And do those parks meet your needs? Do you have enough trails? Are they, they do people have access? Are they distributed equitably across the district? Uh, and we do that in a number of ways. Again, to this this week we entered, uh, we we went and inventoried all the components. Um, typically in parks comprehensive plans or parks and recreation master plans, a lot of communities just base their level of service on the number of acres for their population in that community. Um, what we do is, is we say, well, acres are okay, but we're much more interested in what the user experience is and what's in, in those parks. Having a green area that we call a park that has two benches, say, isn't really gonna meet the needs of those community members that live within that short period. So, or, or that short walk. We'll be looking at, at walkability is what we call it, at, at how many parks, how, how many, how much access do people have within a 10 minute walk of their home? And we can map that all out and figure that out. We can look at um, sports opportunities. We can look at sports fields and, and compare that to the age of, of young uh, youth sports participants and say, do these youth sports participants, do they have access within the neighborhood? Is there a gap between where a diamond or a rectangle athletic field is and where these young people live. Um, some of them are very obvious. 
the fact that the dog park is on one side of the one side of the district. Um, but some of them are, are a little more not so obvious, but we're, we will learn about it. We will map those and understand completely. We'll be looking carefully at, at the trail system and figuring out where the gaps are and, and trying to answer those questions that come out of the, the community input, community engagement mm -hmm. survey. From there, we go on to the program analysis and we'll take a deep dive into the recreation program. And, and we will look at things like fill rates and our programs typically offered continuously when maybe they don't go. In other words, they don't meet their minimum minimum participation, so they're canceled. Are there some of those? I don't know that there are, but we're going to to look into how do we um, how are the, the fees and charges determined through their what they call their cost recovery model. We'll be looking at the different kinds of opportunities as they're spread across the district geographically. Um, so there's a whole lot to the recreation analysis. We'll take a deep dive into the finances and provide opportunities to identify uh, a number of, of perhaps finan you know, financing opportunities that may not be in play yet. We don't know. Um, organizational, we'll look at the, the staffing and look at some pretty deep comparisons to say, where is the staffing or the, or the recreation do the, the, the recreation departments have as many people as the maintenance? Uh, do they need that many? Do we? And we'll be looking at, at kind of national benchmarking uh, and, and really, really breaking that out. Again, every community is different. So we'll be couching this with the idea that we don't want decisions made solely on this. They are going to give decision makers opportunity to to really look at to look at this. We'll be taking a deep look into the maintenance. Um, the maintenance processes. How efficient, how effective are, are, you know, is the maintenance team? Do they need more staff? Do they need more seasonal versus full-time? Um, what kind of standards do they have? How is their equipment? How many assets do they have that are at risk? And, you know, so we'll be looking at a number of different things there. We'll be diving into partnerships. Again, we talked about the, we talked about the funding sources. And then we'll take all of this information and we'll come back uh, somewhere between the probably the October time frame or through January, uh, and, and somewhere in that time period, we will be coming back and hosting another town hall meeting and talking to you about what we found. And that that's really um, one of the best opportunities to really learn about the district and your community. Uh, we will do our best to keep the the presentation for findings to less than eighty. Uh, PowerPoint slides, I'm being facetious, but it's really, truly um, a lot of information. But all throughout the process, we will also be providing, um, we call it deliverable um, documents, but but each of these things, each of the, the, the program analysis and the demographics report and all of these things will be available to be posted uh, on the on the website. So the lamalane.org backslash future. Do I have that right? That's correct. Okay. I always want to make sure before I get people wrong in question. After the findings presentation, we will finally start talking about what do we do with all this information? How does this translate into actionable items? So for the first time in this process, we'll start looking at what we call visioning. And we'll be here in the district and we'll, we'll, we'll talk with staff about how we're going to accomplish that. But basically with vision, we, we break out all the key issues, everything that we know, we've got multiple data points. So if the survey said that you need something, a, a new program or a new facility, and the community told us we needed that, the previous planning documents tell us we need that, leadership was concerned you know, in that area, we, we, can, we cross match all the different data points. Those things that are most important will become goals uh, objectives for the next 10 years, and then, of course, actionable items. So then from there, we go to a draft plan. And again, the draft plan will be available electronically for everyone in the community to review and to look at and, um, and, and to tell us, you know, confirm what we learned was correct and what, what the direction we're heading is the direction that everyone want, everyone in the district or majority of folks in the district want us to, to move forward with all their plan. Or they'll say, 
you really need to go back to the drawing board. We will continue to to work in that in uh, attempting to you know to ensure that the draft before it's taken to your board really has a really good a good feel. It'll be shared with decision makers, policy makers in the city of Springfield as well. I'm assuming um, you know others as well that that may may really have an interest in in this. Well, if, if need be and such, we'll sit down and present the draft um, to others that, that may have an interest. So um, with that said, that draft uh, plan for the first time then we'll have cost estimates and we'll look at both the actual capital cost for improvements, but we're also going to be presenting what it costs operationally. So if you build a park, it costs money to maintain it. And so we will be presenting what those operate operating costs would be for any improvements or recommendations that are made. And there we go to a final master plan. And assuming that the uh, the uh, director here and and the board are um, are happy with it, they'll adopt it, and uh, that'll complete what we think will be about a year and a half process. So, with that said, I thank you so much for joining us. Um, that's the end of my formal presentation. At this point, we'd like to ask if you have questions and try to entertain. Before we before we do, I, my first question are for those people at home. Um, Jody, could you inquire how many people at home are live uh, are um, with others watching? In other words, to ensure that, that sure. we have everybody covered. Yeah, just to get an accurate head count, are there people in our online chat? who have multiple people sitting at the same computer. In some dots. Okay, so we have some, some folks responding. Okay, great. So while that's happening, um, let's start with our question and answers. Okay, we have one question from our uh, live audience. Uh, the first question is, can we build a roller rink or use an existing building? And I think that's a good question. Um, or maybe. Yeah, the question is about a roller rink. Yeah, so I think it's it's a. The question is a little bit of uh, The question is, can you build a roller rink, or use an existing facility for one? Um, in terms of recommendations out of the master plan, we'll be again relying on community input. If it turns out that. Um, community is interested, and I really appreciate the question because what this now will do is allow us the opportunity to include that in the survey, so we can find out is there interest in 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 a role in area within the district. I have a question here. I think they're doing online first. Our next Sir? question what? says. I think they're doing online first. Oh. Regarding cost reports at Bob Paper Center, what kind of use is going on? Yeah. Is there any opportunity to revamp them to be used as an open style of play? Or the possibility of adding courts where the current horseshoe pits are on Ice Street? That would be at the Lamb Lane Park where the horseshoe pits are. And I think that kind of goes similar to your previous statement, Jeff, is that this is an um, area of interest and, and something that we can be evaluating during the process. Yeah, or or for um, existing facilities, if it's a maintenance a maintenance issue, there are district representatives here, of course, tonight, and I'm sure that they're uh, they're taking note of this. And Eric, is there anything else you would like to add on to that? Uh, Let me get me. There were people at the old roller rink from up from Roseburg. And I'm not talking about one or two. I'm talking about a grandma with a car full or a van full of grandkids with a whip, a chair, and a pistol to go along and keep them in somewhat near line. And they had a they had a ball. And they were wearing grandma out and she still had to drive back down to Roseburg. So the roller rink will attract more people from out of the area. And you know what that don't have any rank than what we have in any area. I don't know what the percentages were back then, but uh, they were sure that I'll put it that way. Now the other roller rink that I know of 
It is up north of Corvallis, out in the swamp that stands about seven feet off the ground because it kept flooding out in there. I don't, I don't know if that thing still even can even be allowed in it or not anymore. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much for that feedback. And so we'll have that noted here as part of our. I can hear you, but I don't understand you. Thank you for that feedback. Okay. And we have it noted here as part of the meeting. Um, and there will, of course, be more opportunities to reiterate that as the process goes on. It, you'll get another chance to speak up later. Oh, I, I, I said my piece. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we don't have any further questions from our live audience online or in person, so I'd like to open the floor if anyone has a, a hand to raise. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Don Delaney. Um, I'm a local disc golf player and a member of the Eugene Disc Golf Board. Um, I'm attending this meeting tonight to show support for the potential new disc golf courses that uh, could be constructed in the Willamette area. Uh, during the comprehensive plan. Um, a bit of history about disc golf memberships. Uh, in 2020, memberships of the PDGA, which is the Professional Disc Golf Association, were 26,632 individuals. And in 2021, that number rose to 44,420, a 66% increase of new member growth. Disc golf is not a fringe sport, it is not a fad, and is quickly growing every day in popularity. In 2020, there were 6,936 new courses in the United States. And in 2021, that number climbed to 7,737, which is a 12% growth in one year. In Oregon alone in 2021, there are 2,327 active PDGA members playing on 157 courses and competing in 183 events for the year. As you please consider the community benefit of a course, on the proposed site that would be extremely beneficial as well as being well received within the disc golf community. One of the sayings in disc golf is grow the sport. And I ask you to please help with the growth of this sport by providing a wonderful opportunity with another course in our beloved community for all to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. So much for that feedback and for, for the disc golf community in that way. We have another question from our internet audience, which says, isn't it possible to have multiple attractions within the park to please the community? For example, this golf course, trails, access to the river within a single park. As a matter of fact, that's a cornerstone. That's a great question. That's a cornerstone of our level of service analysis. The way we approach it is we look at a particular park uh, based on the standard across the system of having three or four of those kind of attractions or components and where those parks meet that standard of having three or four items within the park that would draw people. There's a difference between having a, a ball field or a disc golf course in a park and having restrooms and benches. Restrooms and benches are what we call comfort amenities and they, they allow people to have a greater experience but don't necessarily draw people to the park. And so we, we, we look first in terms of our level of service at how many different things are there to do. And those parks that do not have very many things to do or a diversity of things to do. For instance, you might have 30 horseshoe pits, but if that's all you have, it really doesn't count as 30 different things to do. So we look at that. When we do our analysis, by the way, we also break it down in communities by income and by, um, by ethnic background. So we can tell in a particular neighborhood how the parks are, you know, how people have access and what's available to each, er each and every kind of, uh, kind of what we call a cross tab in our, in our data analysis. So I hope that answers your question. Very good question. Any more questions online? Oh, go ahead. Is the park that's off of Hayden Bridge that goes to the river, that county or that one I'm leaving? Like a, there's a boat ramp there. Harvest Land Lake? Yeah. Which which park is it? What's the name? The, the Harvest Lake. Harvest Lake. Harvest Lake. Got, it has another name to it. Yeah, that is a Boat Lake Park. Okay. That needs, yeah, that needs something because it's kind of scary. <laughs> it's beautiful, but I wouldn't want to go there by myself. 
Thank you for that feedback. It was really useful for us to know. I, I might mention, Jody, safety and security was also mentioned several times by our focus group individuals, focus group participants, and it is something we'll definitely keep our eye on in terms of moving forward. I would just like to kind of make a statement, you know, more along the lines on like the suggestion about the botching ports and things. These are all with the comp plan, the comp, the comp plan update. These are high level concepts that are going to take months and years to, to take place. I just want everyone here to know that you don't have to wait a year and a half to make changes. If you see something, you have an idea, go to our website. Kenny, what's the for, for um, ideas, right? Do we still have that? Yeah, slash future, where you can also get an overview of upcoming events, add a calendar timeline for what's coming up next. And there's just a simple form there that you can give us your name and email address if you wish. It can also be anonymous. Um, and you can submit your idea and, and we'll log it and uh, include it as part of our consideration for this plan. And that could be immediate. It could be like this park needs maintenance or you have a safety concern about another park or would it be great if we had a special event? Please, we love hearing from you. And that's how we base a lot of our most of our programming and services on. So, you know, we want to hear for the big project of what's next, what's the next great thing that we're all going to be proud of. But I want everyone to, to know that there's opportunities now to fix things that we have and make it better. And we're always open to suggestions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. I have another question from our online audience that says, will the analysis also consider park fee structure? I'd love to see full season access to particular facilities like Camp Hut for a discounted price. That's something less than the all access membership deal. Is pricing an area that the study might uh, explore? Um, the district already does a really good job looking at data driven reasons for spending their fees based on a uh, what's called a uh, cost of service or resource allocation study that occurred in 2017, I think, or so. Um, nevertheless, when we do go in to look at the, um, the financial health of the district, we will be looking a little bit at are there things that will pop up and show us are there red flags in terms of fees and charges and make recommendations that are appropriate to that? I see another person online who is typing. Does anyone in our uh, live audience have any more questions or? Excellent. I'm going to just hold on a quick second while this person finishes their, their question. In the meantime, also, if you have an idea that you would like to leave with us um, at the end of the night, we have a submission idea submission box on your way up. That's another good way to just leave a thought. For example, if you really want to nail home the, the bocce ball suggestion, that's a great place to leave, leave that suggestion. Okay, we're still looking at this. And also, we have snacks if you wish to take the snacks on your way up. <laughs> There's another question. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Oh, but I, but I, I was just wondering, uh, Willamette Lane's area, is it the urban growth boundary of Springfield? Or I'm, I'm not sure what um, what expansion of Willamette Lane would be in the future for the fan. Eric, is that a question you can answer? He's been waiting for this question. <laughs> Eric, he's our park planning and facilities director. He didn't hear everyone. Yeah. So, in answer to your question, yes, the land lane service area is essentially the same as Springfield's urban growth boundary. We do own some properties that are outside of the urban growth boundary within Lane County. Uh, but um, otherwise, yes, that, that's how we essentially base our. Service level and population growth projections is based on where you're Thank you. I tried. Oh, good. Okay, we have our next online question, which says It seems like the sport of disc golf is a popular community addition. What next steps would you recommend to the disc golf community to continue the positive momentum? I would say to continue to advocate and do just as this gentleman did tonight to ensure that um, 
that the voice for disc golf players are heard. Um, disc golf is is um, is a sport that is inexpensive to play. It's healthy. It's outdoors. You get a lot of walking when you don't realize sometimes that you've just walked, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of steps when you play. Everybody can play it from young age, uh, young to an. I've been on on courses with seven year olds and seventy seven year olds together. So um, I would say continue to advocate. There are there are not in any park system unlimited uh, unlimited resources. And with that said, if that is truly the desire and need and wish of the of the district residents as a whole then that would be our recommendation to establish additional opportunities. Just real quick with that, if anyone ever wants to provide direct feedback to our board, we have public sessions at our monthly board meetings, which are the second Wednesday of every month. They're all going to be hybrid moving forward, so you can, you're can you more than welcome to attend in person at the Bob Kiefer Center, or you can do it online virtually as well. So we give people up to three minutes to state you know, what they like to see, so um, you're all more than welcome to provide opportunities there as well. Where do you do the board meetings at? In the, in the Ken Long room at the Bob Kiefer Center. Six so o'clock. Be out there. Yes. Not here. No, okay. Right. If there's, um, I don't know if there's any disc golf, it seems in like Clearwater, I don't know if it's an official course, but would, could there be lessons so people could get into it, like at the Eugene Park, but sponsored by Springfield or something? Yeah. Um, we did hear that there's a desire for instruction and for, for disc golf. And when you talk about growing the sport, that's probably a good way to do it is to involve more youth, more children. And so again, that's right now in that bag of activities that we we've, we've heard about, and we'll see how uh, how it shakes out through the process. I have a couple more statements from our online uh, viewers, also in support of disc golf. So I'll just read them. First, disc golf is great for all ages. It's a safe sport, and it's growing exponentially, and it has a dedicated community. And second, disc golf is being embraced more and more by families that want to spend time together, recreating in nature. As an outdoor recreational activity, disc golf's low barrier to entry is one of its most attractive features. People of all ages, skill levels, and physical abilities can participate. Disc golf never discriminates. It's, the sport also provides a highly social environment and enhances communities through health and well-being. It's an all encompassing answer to the obstacles we face as facilitators of parks and recreation. So, more feedback from our online community in uh, response to this so And I believe that that is all the questions from both audiences. And if anyone has any last minute things that they would like to, oh, go ahead. Well, I, I'm curious about something. I, I read a while back that there was some kind of a turtle viewing area that was planned. I'm assuming at um, along the mill race there at the Jasper Trailhead. Where is that? Does this that fit into this? Um, I, I like the turtle, so I'm just sitting there. Yeah, there's a question. Thanks for the question. So uh, about a year and a half ago, we adopted a master plan for the Georgia Pacific Natural Area, which uh, Mill Race Path and uh, portions of the Middle Fork Path across the area. And so yeah, the, the Jasper Trailhead is uh, probably the location that you're talking about out along Jasper Slough. We do know there's an active population of Western Pond Turtle that is using that slough as, as nesting habitat. And our natural resources staff are currently co uh, coordinating with um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to identify the best way to increase opportunities for the community, for the public to, to experience that habitat in a way that lessens impact on the turtles themselves. Uh, we did have a couple of conceptual locations for viewing platforms within that general area, and at this point, still looking at the best way to construct those with the least impact. <laughs> yes. Are there any considerations for like plugins or like parking for bikes and? That's more secure than anybody else. Facilities. 
That's definitely something that I know Jeff has heard about. Jeff and James have heard about through their initial outreach, and I imagine we'll be incorporating some questions along those lines in the online survey, uh, particularly as we look at the need for additional recreation facilities throughout the district, as well as ways that we can upgrade our existing facilities to make sure they're as easy to get to in an environmentally conscious way as possible. Yeah, is there a plan to um, raise wages at Glen Lane Parks to ameliorate the staff shortage issues in parks and in pools like that for life gardens? It's a great question. I don't know if I'm the person to, to take that on, but uh, perhaps we're yeah, sure. So it is of paramount importance for us to try to get as uh, yeah. any uh, frontline staff up to a point where we can open up our facilities to even expand them prior to the pandemic. So um, we um, are very happy to announce that due to some ARPA funding that we were able to secure from the city, we were able to actually create full-time benefited positions for some of those frontline positions in the area of uh, our customer service at the Bob Kiefer Center and out at the aquatic centers, as well as some of those lifeguard positions as well. And we feel that this will really help us be able to provide year round um, employment that's retainable and uh, sustainable as we move forward. But um, we're and we've got some great campaigns going on as well. And there's other training um, stipends and pay that we haven't been able to offer in the past. We're going to be able to do that. So we're actively working on it. And I would say that our the future looks uh, bright on, in that regard. Great question. And then a statement from our online audience saying, I represent a group of women in this golf, and I would like to see a growth in Lane County that mirrors Lane County and the Portland area. One thing I'll say about disc golf is um, we just hired a, a new um, athletics coordinator, Adam Gutierrez. He is a disc golf enthusiast. So, um, you know, I will definitely, I'm sure he's probably already commented about it. If I know Adam, he's just salivating right now hearing all this buzz about because uh, he definitely wants to grow the sport. He's got some great ideas on it. So, I'm going to give it just another quick moment to see if any other questions come through. Any other thoughts from our in person audience? Go Hill, so Doris Ranch, and then there's a hill, I don't know if it's Lamont Heights or something. Is that property that could be a hiking trail? Because it's kind of a little no man's land up there, but I know there's a park up there, but is it property that's not private that people could be able to go from the city to Doris Ranch? Because there's a lot of paths, but there's not a lot of hiking. Just Thurston is the only thing that's steep. So I think the, the property that you're referring to is, is it south of Doris Ranch? As you between Doris Ranch and the line of Heights Park. Yeah, like that, or that come over that hill to the across the tracks by Booth Kelly here. Yes, yeah. Uh, so a good majority of that area is currently um, uh, subdivided for residential development in the city of Springfield. There are existing uh, street rights of way uh, that are that were created as part of that. Um, my understanding is that the current city development standards make it very difficult for those properties to develop. But as they do, uh, or as uh, we continue to look at expansion of our services and the need for more recreational opportunities in that portion of the community, uh, certainly the street rights of way would allow for us to extend multi-use paths or other trail connections without having to acquire private property to do that. But at, at this point, uh, that's probably the, the best opportunity that we have. Right, I'm not seeing any more questions online or in person. So what I'm going to do is kind of draw this meeting to a close. Um, but if you have any further questions after this meeting, go ahead and send them to our project team. Public um, information up here. You can also submit an idea on the landline.org slash future. And if you leave your contact information, we will get back to you. So oh, with that, thank you so much for joining this meeting to talk about the Lane Comprehensive Plan. And please do continue to give your feedback for this year-long process. Information about upcoming events and opportunities to get involved with that Blackland outward slash future. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. 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 Okay.